well, this is an annual meeting and I came dressed for the occasion. I don't know about you. <laughs> I think you've come for the sunshine, so that's brilliant. So good evening. Yes, I'm the High Sheriff of Buckinghamshire and there's a couple of ex-High Sheriffs in the audience, so don't judge me too harshly, please. <laughs> um, but I am going to give you a big, a bit of a, not a big history, a bit of a his history of my role and what I'm trying to achieve now. So, just in case you don't know, except for the monarchy, it is the oldest office in the country um, going back over a thousand years. Um, of course, then it was responsible for law and order. It could raise a hue and cry and trample across the green spaces that are now North Buckinghamshire, Milton Keynes, uh, to trap down felons. It had to attend executions. It also had to collect your taxes and also could raise an army from the local community to go and fight the, the various wars that kings or queens wanted to do. I'm very pleased to say I don't raise taxes and I don't attend executions, but it is still a role that is appointed by the Queen and it is purely honorary and it is very much about supporting the judiciary and anything around law and order, so support the governors in prisons, uh, senior police officers, the probation service, and most importantly, for me, the voluntary and community sector, and anything that prevents offending and reoffending. And I'm just going to literally spend a minute to talk about that. We know what the causes of crime actually are, and it is poverty and mental health. And when we talk about poverty, we talk about poverty, poverty of love and emotional support. Poverty of education, financial poverty, and all that brings around lack of food or not a good uh, diet and not great quality accommodation. But in the last few months, I have learned a few really rather saddening statistics and information about what is a straight line into prison. Children that are excluded from school and attend what we call pupil referral units of which we have four in Milton Keynes and others in the county of which I have attended a couple is a straight line into prison. 70% of people that enter prison have mental health issues. Children in the care system, that's babies born, little children, who for whatever reason cannot stay with their parents that go into the care system and that are fostered, perhaps with one, two, three or four foster parents over a period of time, end up in prison. There are lots of organisations, I would say mainly voluntary sector organisations, that do a huge amount in mentoring and support young people to prevent that happening, to break that cycle. So what's that got to do with the Parts Trust? Well, I really am truly delighted to be here because Parts Trust is one of the most successful organisations, not just in Milton Keynes, but in the country, and I want to say in the world, but I'm one of those people that like to exaggerate now and again, but you are a very successful organisation. And because the voluntary sector really makes that difference to people's lives. When we're building a new town or new city as we like to be known, we build the infrastructure, we build the places where people work, we bring in businesses, we build houses and roads. But the thing that really makes it a place that people want to settle is the voluntary and community sector that provides the support people need, but also the interesting things to do and the places to go. Without that, it wouldn't be the place it is now. The green space that the Parks Trust has created or owns, 6,000 acres of parkland, lakes and woods, a large collection of wonderful public art that they look after and is free to us all. But beyond that, they're also a great influencer and they use that expertise, for example, to engage in Plan MK, which is about the expansion of our town. The Parks Trust is there contributing to the development plan to help shape how our MK will grow its network of green space and the quality of interconnected green infrastructure. In the eastern and western expansion areas, the Parks Trust has ponds and wildlife areas, and they will continue with that work. But in other places around the country where developers are putting up houses, that isn't the case. The developer will often retain that green space and pose an annual charge on the residents, which only goes up year after year, 
for maintenance. Thank goodness for the Parks Trust that develops our green spaces to enhance our wildlife and goes way beyond the four times a year of mowing the grass. Then there are the activities in our 6,000 acres. If you go on the website, there are too many to mention, but I'll mention a few. Archery, running, orienteering, petang and ping, model boats, treetop extreme, I'm not doing that, walking, I might do that. Events, the World Picnic to MK Play Day, with five to 10,000 people in our parks. MK Fireworks, Armistice Day at the MK Rose, Islamic Arts, Culture and Heritage, which I attended very recently, absolutely packed with people from all over Milton Keynes of all cultures. Partnerships, they're brilliant at partnerships with so many organisations, the Community Foundation, the Cenotaph Trust, MK Council, Ride High, just to name a few. They engage young people and have created junior rangers and youth rangers, and it's those youth organisations that can often just help young people have another activity outside of school where they may not be thriving as well as they could be. And they have well over 200 volunteers supporting their around 40, 42 staff. There is a mix of literally hundreds of activities in the Parks Trust. I forgot to mention push chairs in the park. I see them every Monday that I'm here at a Cenotaph treat, uh, meeting. With their buggies, with the babies, out for a brisk walk, lots of chat and lots of support. They organise walking groups, some are very bespoke, some just only for women. So if you're new to the city, you've got a place to go. If you're newly retired, you've got something to do. If you've lost a loved one, you've got more people that you could meet. Weekend activities like the Heritage Weekend that I attended recently. Most people thought I was one of the exhibits, so it took quite some explaining. No, this is my costume for 2019. I'm a real person and this is what I wear. Social interaction and connection is really important. And the Parts Trust who creates the space and also the activity or supports organisations in their activities in the park. Green spaces are important for mental health. They can reduce health inequalities. They improve health and well-being and aid in the treatment of mental illness. Some analysis suggests that physical activity in a natural environment helps remedy mild depression and reduce physiological stress indicators. The space we all have is free for everyone. The Parks Trust does a huge amount to engage and bring people into the parks to experience, them, to experience it. And I know from my voluntary work with MK Rose, when I'm up at the Rose, I meet people all the time who come for the first time and they are truly amazed at what we have in Milton Keynes. The green space and the woods and lakes stimulate and provide creative safe places for children and families to spend time, for children to explore, for the world around them. In a relaxed and fun way, they will develop important skills, learning through play, creative play, developing language, and all those other skills they need for life. So tonight, I think it's also a chance, as well as questioning the Parks Trust and what they've been doing, is to thank the volunteers, the trustees, and all the staff for the leadership they show, the expertise they have, to help us create a successful and vibrant community and provide opportunities to experience the environment enjoy the physical, the social and the cultural activities, plus the volunteering opportunities, which is so immensely valuable to people enhancing their health and well-being. And I also just want to add, last night I was somewhere speaking to a group of people much like yourselves, and we were giving awards on behalf of Worktree. And the Parts Trust got first prize in one of those awards. You didn't know, David. Well, seven of your staff have been leaving the premises and volunteering in schools and doing what they call career workouts. And they do some of those career workouts, because I've been to one of them, in one of the pupil referral units. And they talk to the students about the work opportunities there are out there. And the students can ask any questions they like. And it really does have a positive impact. Anyway, you got first prize in the small employer under 50. Uh, so thanks to seven of your employees who've been uh, spending the old hour or two volunteering in schools. Thank you for inviting me and have a great evening. <coughs>
my surprise, we won an award. The mayor just told me he was there and he accepted it on our behalf. <laughs> was there a check involved? No, no. Oh, okay. Oh, a pat on the back. Okay. It's still valuable, still, but yeah. Okay. Um, so I, I just would like to reflect uh, on the the past year, 2018-19, um, and as I I seem to always say, it's been another very good year for the Parks Trust in in lots of different ways. Our, our mission is uh, to create beautiful and inspirational parks, woods, lakes, uh, and landscapes that are loved by the people of Milton Keynes forever. So. There are three bits to that mission, of course. The first bit, uh, inspirational parks. Well, we've off to a good start. We were given a very good set of parks by the Development Corporation, and we continue to take on new parks as they are developed by, uh, uh, by the developers now. Um, and uh, we have to maintain those to a, to a good standard, and I think we do that pretty well. We've got some pictures of our folks maintaining them. Yes, oh, here we are, Ma maintaining the landscape to a good standard. Uh, we have a really good loyal team of contractors doing that for us, uh, but we also have our own direct workforce team, now numbering 20 young people. Um, some of them are trainees and some of them have been through the training process and are now fully fledged craftsmen. And we continue to develop that and we probably will grow that by another four or five people next year so we think having a mix of contractors and our own workforce is probably the right thing to do um, part of our maintaining the parks is to improve the facilities and improve the presentation the way in which we explain the parks and what is there to people and a big project for us now is the great linford manor heritage project where uh, we have a group of new volunteers the uh, uh, friends of Great Linford Manor, uh, and we have a couple of staff now who are busy working on that project with Heritage Lottery Fund money um, to really investigate what is there and how best we can uh, present it and uh, uh, and bring back to life some of the uh, some of the real important heritage aspects of the 18th century design. There, this is um, if you can see the screen. This is a uh, archaeological dig that we had there earlier this year trying to find what was under the ground um, and this is at the Doric seat a little corner of the of the park where they found some very interesting walls I believe me they were interesting um, so improving facilities presenting parks and um, we're very pleased that as well as the uh, work tree award we collect other awards during the year um, a great award that we have just won, well Milton Keynes has won, I wouldn't say we won it, uh, we nominated Milton Keynes for this, along with the Ramblers, and this was for the Ramblers Best Walking Neighbourhood Award, you may have seen this on television, we're just going to show you a little video of the, uh, nom the what was it, the nomination video? Yeah. yeah. When people come to Milton Keynes, they're genuinely really surprised by the hidden greenness. Um, it really does surprise people. And I know people won't believe that where I'm standing is Milton Keynes, but genuinely it is. We have history, we have green space, we have, you can hear the birds singing. 40% of the total area is green space with approximately 300 kilometres of footpaths in amongst that green space, but also on top of that, you've got the normal footpaths that serve where people live. Milton Keynes has got an extensive network of footpaths, green routes, that enable you to get across the city in a nice, safe, away from traffic environment. It enables you to actually enjoy the place without having to resort to taking cars. You can actually just relax and, and take a walk. Obviously, it's in an urban environment, but um, there's, there's a lot of green space out there. So you get this mix of, of local communities, estates, 
uh, where people work and then the next minute you're out in, into what seems like the, the countryside. It really is possible to get across Milton Keynes by walking or cycling without crossing a road because we have these fantastic redways that can get you across and they are going in exactly the same direction as the main roads are um, and they are for cyclists, they're for walkers, it's for everyone to use so it really is forward thinking um, way of getting across an urban environment. Yeah, very good. So, uh, and another award that we've just won is, is this one. This is the green flag. So this is the latest one. Third time running we've, we've won that. Um, Rob and James have just been up to collect that to the award ceremony only this afternoon. So uh, this is still a bit crumpled. We'll have it iron. <laughs> um, uh, and that's quite an achievement because the green flag award uh, we're the only city that has got it for all its parks, so it's a, a, a city-wide award that we have we have got for our parks. Uh, we were inspected this year by a, a team of people who come from uh, other parts of the country, and they've written us a great long report, but it's all really complimentary, and we're, we're very proud of this. And as you can tell, we're really proud of everything that we do, really, uh, I think with just cause. Um, We've continued our investment during the year in, uh, in Willem Lake, uh, including some new pedalos. So there we are, look at those. Um, and Willem Lake really does go from strength to strength and uh, is attracting huge numbers now. Uh, and we've got other plans for further investment there coming up. But if you remember the mission, uh, beautiful and inspirational parks, lakes and woods, um, that are loved by the people of Milton Keynes. So we don't think it's enough just for us to provide these parks and beautiful spaces. Uh, we want to try and uh, ensure that people enjoy them, uh, appreciate them, value them, and, and love them. Yes, we're not afraid to use that word. So how do we do that? Well, we do that in three different ways. Three E's. Events. So we organise lots of events in our parks to get people to come in. And increasingly, we're organising events with the community and helping other people. They call it capacity building, helping other people to organise events for themselves. And um, we're very, very proud of the uh, cultural events that we have now in the parks that Julia mentioned some of those. Uh, we've got Africa Diaspora Day happening on this Saturday. Um, what other events? We've, uh, we've got the World Picnic at the end of this month. Uh, so a whole host of cultural events. The, the next E on the bit of how do we make people or encourage people to love and appreciate their parks is education or outdoor learning. And our work there has continued. We, well, I tell people every year about the outdoor learning work that we do. Um, we think it's so important to try and open kids' eyes to the world around them. So we continue to work with school groups uh, and not just school groups, we do work with adults as well, adult learning programmes as well. Um, and we're very pleased we've just put together a new outdoor learning strategy for next year. Uh, and we're in the process of recruiting two more uh, outdoor learning practitioners uh, to, to help us deliver that work. Okay, um, and then the third bit really is communication. So. Uh, and uh, engagement. How do we engage people in our work? How do we engage people in the parks? Well, you've got to do it by showing them and telling them what's there. And of course, these days that means websites and social media, which we think we're pretty good at now. We were a bit slow to it at first, but we're now, uh, I think, pretty well up to speed with all that. Um, and also signs, uh, good old fashioned signs that uh, promote the parks. And uh, you'll can't have failed to have seen some of these around around the place and they we think they really are making a difference to people's awareness of the parks they drive past them on the grid roads uh, and they uh, they come back and explore the park at the weekend or in the evenings and I think there's a lot of evidence that they are really leading to much greater use of the park and then the third bit of our mission so beautiful parks loved by the people of Milton Keynes. If we do all that, that's fine, but we've got to do it forever. Uh, so, you know, that's quite a challenge. We're not just here to do this for a few years. We've got this job to do in perpetuity. Um, 
So building a strong and financially sound organisation is absolutely crucial to us achieving our mission. Uh, and last year our financial performance was okay, um, well, a bit more than okay I guess. We made an operating surplus of 194,000. Our property portfolio, which is where the bulk of our investments are and where the bulk of our income comes from, uh, grew in value by about a million pounds. We built a new builder's merchant in Mansfield, believe it or not. Strange, strange but true. Um, we invested quite a bit of money in Milton Keynes, so Warren Park, uh, uh, a business park uh, up near Wolverton, we bought that last year, and the pride of our property portfolio is our marina. Here we are, our marina just across the road here, which we uh, purchased on the 31st of March last year uh, from Crest, who are building it as part of their development, and we've now, we now own that and run that marina. Uh, and very fine it is too, we're really proud of it. Um, our other investments are on the stock market and they increased by about a million pound in value. So we finished the year with investments worth 143 million. Now, sounds a lot of money, we're not just showing off about that. It really is crucial that we have this, uh, this size of portfolio in order to generate the income to look after the parks. So it's not just for vanity that we're trying to grow this great big portfolio, it's for the long-term security of all the green space in Milton Keynes. Uh, it is really our only significant source of income. We don't get money from the government or from the local authority. We don't ask for it and we don't, we don't get it. Um, uh, but our model is such that we, we, we live off uh, the money that we can earn from our parks and, the, and our investments. And we have some big challenges ahead for us. Um, you may think, why on earth do we need so much money? Well, just look at one of the challenges that's coming up, and that's, uh, uh, that's ash dieback. Um, in Milton Keynes, in, in some of our woodlands, ash makes up 60 or 70% of the woods. And in lots of our plantations, it's a very significant tree. Uh, we've got about 1,000 acres of woodland that we own. Uh, and ash is probably the most common tree in all that woodland. Yet, over the next few years, probably 95% of the ash trees will be dead. Um, so that's a massive challenge for us. Financially, we don't, haven't really costed it out, but uh, most of those ash trees, when they get the ash dieback disease, they become very brittle, they become very dangerous potentially, next to footpaths, next to roads, next to people's properties. So we're going to have to take them down, and you. You can't just cut it at the bottom and fell it like you see in Canada. You've got to go up and dismantle the tree and take it down very carefully. So that is a massive expense for us that we are going to have to provide for in our accounts going forward. Um, and then there are other pests and diseases that are coming into this country and becoming more common. There's one awful one called the oak processionary moth. That's the little caterpillar. Um, looks rather cute. But I can tell you it's not. The hairs on that caterpillar uh, uh, really do constitute a major health hazard. Uh, and if we get this in Milton Keynes on our oak trees, uh, the people dealing with it will have to be uh, completely uh, clad in suits with gaffer tape around the, hand, the feet and the cuffs and uh, breathing apparatus because the hairs of this uh, processionary moth uh, will get into the atmosphere and then cause immense uh, public health problems. So. That's another potential major cost for us. Um, it's no coincidence that these diseases are coming in and we're, we're starting to suffer from them. Global trade is one thing, but probably climate change is, is, uh, is the main cause of, these, uh, of the increase in pests and diseases that we're going to have to cope with. And on that subject, I'm just going to ask Phil, our Head of Environment, to, to tell us a few, uh, a few words about climate change and how that's affecting us and how we're responding to it. Bill. Thanks David, good, good evening everyone. Um, yeah, as David just said, I'm going to talk a bit about um, climate change and carbon management um, as well. I'm also going to talk about another couple of subjects that David asked me to touch upon. Uh, one is, uh, and they're, they're all sort of widespread uh, things, not only affecting us here in Milton Keynes, the other, another subject is the, the loss of biodiversity. 
Um, it's an international thing. Um, and uh, the final thing I'll talk about is something that Julia mentioned uh, earlier about um, the future management of green space and development areas. Um, so, uh, climate change and carbon management. Um, I mean, there's no doubt it's happening, climate change, and much faster than people predicted. A few years ago, nine out of ten of the uh, warmest years uh, on record have occurred since um, 2002. The average UK temperature has, has risen by um, 0.8 degrees centigrade since 1970. Um, we're experiencing the, the changes in wetting patterns that I'm sure you can all re refer to, warmer and wetter winters, drier, hotter summers, um, more, more droughts, more flooding, um, and the spread of um, pests and diseases, as David's been um, mentioning. Um, I mean, the role we, our parks will play in mitigating the effects of climate change and how they will be affected by climate change is something we're looking at increasingly. And we're considering what we can do to also to help slow the pace of um, climate change um, through our operations. Of course, we're lucky in Melton Keynes that given the way the city was planned, we've got a very generous and joined up network of, um, of green spaces. Um, Tatnoe Valley Park there's a, a prime example, um, which makes us a much better place than many other towns and cities around the world to withstand the effects of climate change. Um, our linear parks and landscape grid road corridors will help to keep the city cooler in hot summers and they'll take up water um, during periods of intense rainfall, helping to protect homes and businesses from flooding. Uh, and a term you might hear used to describe those types of benefit is ecosystem services. Um, and of course, how climate change is being responded to is an emerging area of science and policy. For example, I expect you are aware of the government's recent pledge for the UK to become carbon neutral by 2050. And much scientific research on how to mitigate the effects of climate change is being undertaken. For example, you may have seen recent media reports about research that concluded widespread mass tree planting across the planet would be the most effective way to reduce atmospheric carbon dioxide and help to address climate change. So, does that mean we're going to be undertaking widespread tree planting across our parks in Milton Keynes, converting it more of it to woodland? Well, we have no plans to do that at present. Rather, we're aware that we have a highly diverse network of landscapes and habitats across our parks, and they are there to serve the public and be used in many different ways. Most of the land cover in our parks is grassland, 62% of the land area, in fact. And these grasslands are valuable for many reasons. For example, our meadows are an important habitat for a diversity of non-wooden wildlife, and our amenity grass areas provide space for people to play and move around. If we were to plant trees everywhere, that would re reduce the amount of space for those important functions. We regularly review the way we manage our grasslands to ensure we're doing this in the optimum way. In consideration of biodiversity, we're leaving more areas of long grass <coughs> through the summer months to allow more wildflowers to flourish and provide habitat for insects and other wildlife. And don't forget that permanent grassland, as well as woodland, also locks up carbon in its roots and in the soil, especially grasslands left long longer and cut less often. Now, 13% of our land area um, is used as grazing pasture under our agricultural enterprise. And again, the environmental impacts of rearing livestock have become more widely publicised. So you could ask, why don't we stop grazing the land with animals and plant trees instead? Well, one consequence of doing that would be the damage it would cause to the scheduled ancient monuments, like this one at Old Hoog Orberton, that underlie large areas of our pasture land. And also, the mix of open pastures surrounded by hedgerows in our linear parks is valuable for conserving the city and the countryside character of Milton Keynes and the range of wildlife that is adapted to that mix of habitats. We are careful to avoid overgrazing the land. We don't use artificial fertilisers. We don't spread manure on the land. Um, also, the lamb and beef we produce goes into the UK market, thereby reducing the amount of meat that we need to import that's been reared and goes you know, many miles um, across the environment from overseas. The main message I'm giving here that we believe it is the diversity and the well-made condition of the landscapes in our, and habitats in our care that is important in delivering a range of ecosystem services and which will help Milton Keynes withstand the effects of climate change. We are watching this very closely, however, and we're going to be do doing more work to understand this as we go forward. One area we'll be looking at is to better understand the carbon balance of our green estate and how our woodlands, the grasslands, 
and other habitats are taking up and storing carbon. And the other aspect when considering our response to climate change is of course how we go about our business as an organisation. Now in our annual report um, you'll see reference to the fact that we've been investing in solar panels and other energy efficiency measures in our buildings and we've increased the proportion of our endowments that are invested in climate friendly funds. However we want to do more in, to in, understand the impact of our operations on carbon dioxide emissions in particular and to this end we've recently um, commissioned the Carbon Trust a leading organisation in this field to help us understand our carbon footprint and thereafter we'll develop an action plan to reduce our carbon emissions and our aim is to be carbon neutral um, by the year 2030 if not before. Now moving on to the next topic um, uh, I want to talk about is the loss of biodiversity uh, and as I said before this is an area of real concern internationally about the decline in species in wildlife over recent decades. Um, here at the Parks Trust we've been looking to conserve biodiversity ranging from larger scale projects like creating new nature reserves like the floodplain forest at Wolverton right through to smaller projects we carry out all over our parks every year such as building hibernacula for reptiles and amphibians and also within the last year we took on an additional biodiversity officer to help us in that work. Now one of the areas of concern I'm sure you would have heard about is the decline in pollinating insects such as bees. Um, a new project we started this summer is monitoring bumblebee populations in sample areas of our parks and grid roads. And this work is being assisted by some of our wonderful volunteers who do so much to help us conserve biodiversity on our land. Now, as well as helping us to assess the population of bumblebees we have, the project will help us better understand the effects of our different grass cutting regimes for that group of species, so we can do more to conserve them. Now, insects in particular Recording them, surveying them, is really valuable because they're a very good indicator of the state of the environment. Now one encouraging find we had from last year were two species of damselfly that were recorded for the first time in our parks. The beautiful demoiselle, I think I've got I've pronounced that correctly, there's a photograph of it, and, and the willow emerald um, in the Ewes Valley and in Tatno Park. Now, that's great to see those um, species and you know the fact they've been recorded for the first time um, because they are, will be a condition uh, sorry an indicator that the condition of the habitats the wetlands and the, and the habitats around them are in good condition for biodiversity now as I said we use volunteers um, we have great support from volunteers to help us um, do those um, surveys um, but we do employ professional ecologists to undertake the surveys so we can gather that data about how biodiversity is faring on our land. And we do look at that long and hard. Our biodiversity officer, Martin Kincaid, leads in that for us. I'm sure many of you will know him. And he wrote a report, The State of Biodiversity. Um, looking at the latest data um, we have on that, we've reported that to our board. And that shows us how our wildlife on our land is faring. Um, and we do uh, compare that to um, uh, international and national uh, figures. Now for groups like moths and butterflies, we do have some really um, you know, good observations and purple emperor, this is a photograph of it, which makes our work to maintain the habitats, the, the, the grasslands, the, the habitats suitable for those, all the more important. But, but luckily it's not all like that here in Milton Keynes, we are sort of bucking the trend a bit. Um, the work we've been doing for wetlands has shown great dividend uh, in that we're getting more wetland birds um, in our parks. Um, and also we're seeing uh, what, what a group of um, plants called wildflowers in the wider countryside, um, which is a group of plants that say the ecologists use and monitor, and we find that, the, that their populations are holding up quite well, particularly in our meadows and our woodlands. Now the final um, uh, project I was going to touch upon, again mentioned earlier on, um, are our concerns about um, the management of new parks in growth areas and development areas. And our Milton Keynes continues to grow, and I'm sure you've all heard initiatives like the Oxford Milton Keynes Cambridge Growth Arc, um, and the council, our council here have got the MK2050 strategy. Milton Keynes is going to continue to grow um, in, in future. Um, but the way this development occurs will of course be much different to the way Milton Keynes was first developed. We haven't got a development corporation. Most development is being done by private landowners and private developers. So for us, the big question is who's going to take ownership of and look after the new public parks and green spaces in those development areas? Will the developers pass those areas on to the Parks Trust? 
Unfortunately, what we're finding is that de developers are placing the public green spaces in their developments into the hands of private management companies. Those companies then recoup their costs by charging um, residents annual service charges, often with disproportionate administrative charges on top. This is already happening in Milton Keynes, and we've heard a number of, of stories of residents are saying the companies they're paying are not providing good service. Now, we feel very strongly, of course, um, that, that Parks Trust is the best place to organisation to take new green spaces and, uh, from developers, and then that's best done via our tried and tested leasehold with endowment model. I'm glad to say that many of the green spaces in the currently planned development areas are earmarked to come to us, where the developers have signed Section 106 planning obligation agreements for that to happen. However, as I've said, it's not the same for all areas and we are rather fearful for the future. Um, in raising this issue, we're not seeking to blame developers. We recognise they work in a market environment. However, we do feel that really there is enough value in uplift, uplifting value when development takes place to ensure that developers should be able to set aside endowments to pay an organisation like the Parks Trust to become the stewardship body for green spaces and their developments. Now the key to this is to create the right sort of policy environment where developers and house builders don't have the option of using private management companies. And we have been working with Milton Keynes Council to address this issue. Um, and thanks to the awareness uh, raising efforts of um, Sam Crooks, the um, current mayor and one of our um, trustees, um, the council recently passed a resolution opposing the principle of developers passing public parks and green spaces to the, into the hands of um, private management companies and their strong preference that those spaces come to the Parks Trust. However, the national planning system does not currently enable the council to put in place a planning policy that will ensure that that will happen. And we're working to try and address that issue too. And the latest I can report on that is that we have the um, Deputy Director of Planning Policy and Reform from the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government coming to see us in Milton Keynes uh, later this month We'll discuss our concerns with her about that and we hope that she'll take that message back um, to ministers and, and they'll look into the issue. Um, so that was all I wanted to say. Um, thank you and I'm sure we'll have an opportunity um, for you to ask questions about that after um, Dave has spoken again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, now I'm just going to quickly introduce Zoe, our Deputy Chair. Zoe has been on the board since 2013. Um, she is a local businesswoman, an entrepreneur. Uh, is that right? Um, Zoe started her first childcare nursery uh, in 1989 and now runs a really inspiring social enterprise called Acorn Early Years Foundation. Uh, it has now got 11 children's nurseries, uh, forest schools, uh, after school clubs, uh, a training centre, uh, a meal service, a whole, whole stack of stuff. But uh, she is also one of our, she finds time, uh, uh, you know, aside from all that, to be our vice chair and uh, a key trustee for us. So. six years ago, it doesn't seem that long, for purely selfish reasons if I'm honest, because I wanted the experience of being a trustee, because I had my own trustee board as a CEO of a charity, and I wanted to see what it was like on the other side of the fence, but also because I was quite um, a keen fan of the Parks Trust, still am I have to say, really admire the work they do, um, and actually being involved in it, I admire it even more. So we have 18 trustees, which is quite a large board. But that number helps us to have the spread of skills, experiences, and the diversity of backgrounds, especially as the work of the Parks Trust covers a very wide <coughs> range of activities, from managing biodiversity to the financial investments, is a huge spread. And all of us either live or work in Milton Keynes, or most of us do both. So in the last year, four new trustees joined the board. Two of them, Dan Gilbert and Jennifer Markley, were councillors nominated by Milton Keynes Council replacing councillors Norman Miles and Peter Geary, who had both served on the board for many years. Um, and then the other two were recruited through open advert and competition and selected to fill the skill, skills gaps that we'd identified. 
I have to say we're very fortunate for a charity compared to most charity boards. We're always sport for choice with a number of people wanting to be trustees for us. So we're very fortunate. Ian Jackson is one of our new trustees. He's a very experienced property professional, which is important to us as the bulk of our income, as David explained, comes from our commercial property investments. And Nick Lloyd, who is managing partner of EMW Law. Always a good idea to have a lawyer on the board. As a board, we have some very challenging debates, but we do usually achieve consensus, which is good. We also have several subcommittees to spread the load, and they focus on different areas of the business. We try very hard not to get involved in the operational matters to the point of interfering, but we do like to do a bit of a deep dive here and there. Last year, we created a new subcommittee as a result of the external governance review we had the year before, and the new subcommittee is about governance and human resources. We wanted to make sure that we are doing everything correctly, that we have the highest standards of governance, and also to make sure that our staff, we have got about 75 permanent staff and another 75 seasonal staff, are well supported and happy in their roles. So being a trustee is entirely voluntary and it is a huge responsibility, but it's a great privilege and it's really rewarding. We have to balance the need to be supportive and to scrutinise. We have to exercise prudent stewardship, but also to encourage the team to be stretched, to improve and to innovate. And we work with the senior management team on strategy so that looking forward, we, are, we know where we're going with the organisation in the long term. And in addition to the 18 trustees, we have, as was mentioned earlier, 200 plus volunteers. And they do all manner of things for the trust, from patrolling the parks, supporting the community rangers, helping with school sessions, doing practical conservation tasks, and supporting the events team. And last year, they contributed some 4,000 hours. So I'd really like to give them a big thank you. And I think all my fellow trustees would say they're really proud of the trust. And I'd like to just end by saying a thank you to them, particularly our chairman, Richard Foreman, to all our volunteers, and especially to David and all the hard working team here. I hope you can agree that we should all be very proud of what the Parks Trust do for Milton Keynes. Thank you. Thank you.